What is up, you guys? Teller checking in for UFC 300. The UFC is hitting the century mark once again. You guys know they always got to put together an extremely stacked card when they hit that century mark. Uh, this card uh, is amazing. I'm very, very excited for it. Uh, but I will say this, just to compare it to the other uh, 100 markers that we've hit, I would say UFC 100 was the best. I, I would have that over UFC 200. And I would say, actually, I would put UFC 300 uh, debatably over UFC 200. And, and if you guys uh, were still getting your diapers changed back at UFC 100, and uh, shout out to everyone that knows the inside joke there, people on Instagram giving me hell, calling me an old timer. But hey, I'm a long time fan. But UFC 100 was epic, man. You had Brock Lesnar smashing Frank Mir in the main event, uh, GSP styling on Tiago Alves, Hendo with the Superman punch on Bisping back then. Uh, you know, we had Jim Miller on this card, of course, Jim Miller on all three of these cards. Uh, but on all three of the, the 100 marker cards, we had a young John Jones pulling off a guillotine choke early on. Now, UFC 300 is similar in a sense that we have uh, another young stud prospect like Bo Nickel, who's early on in his career. Uh, so, you know, just some things to think about here. But uh, I'm very, very excited for this fight card. I'm filming this here on my birthday. And I want to let you guys know it means a lot to me to have you guys tuning in. Uh, for, for my predictions for this fight card, because obviously you guys can be checking out a variety of people. And uh, I put a lot of time into what I do over here. And I just, I just want to let you guys know, I appreciate you. And being that it's my birthday, stick around to the end, to the closing thoughts. And I'll tell you guys a funny story that happened to me when I was a young buck uh, on one of my birthdays. I was probably like nine, nine or 10. It's a kind of a funny story. I'll throw that in the closing thoughts. You guys know we're going to hit you up with some, some deep closing thoughts for this episode. And uh, we're going to jump right into the first fight right here, right now. Um, just if you can like this video, subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out. If you guys can subscribe to the channel, helps me know you guys like what I'm doing here and it helps me evolve the channel and, and keep growing it. And just so you guys know, I'm going to be pumping a lot of content out all week for UFC 300. All right. So catch me on my social media on Instagram at MMA fortune teller underscore and on Twitter at the MMA teller. And if you want to work with me for my exclusive bets for this card, of course, you guys know you can reach out to me. I got my email scrolling below if you're interested. All right, guys. With that all being said, let's jump into this first fight. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show. This is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA the fortune MMA teller. Fortune the teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. So check this out right off the rip. We got two polarizing fighters squaring off against each other. Devison Figueredo taking on Cody Garbrandt. Of course, uh, Devison has bumped up to the bantamweight division now. Uh, he's coming off a victory against Rob Font. I think that he showcased that he, he fits right into this division. Uh, that weight cut was brutal for him uh, for years. Uh, it definitely seems it was the right move. He looked good against Rob Font. And this is uh, a pic picture-perfect matchup for him. Let's be quite honest here. Cody Garbrandt is coming off a victory but I have major, major concerns about his chin still, okay? All right, he's coming off that victory against Brian Kelleter, one of my arch nemesis. And uh, that doesn't really say too much. He had the victory before that against Trevin Jones. If you remember, he was running away that entire fight, and Trevin Jones really handled uh, that, that fight uh, horrifically. That was a fight that Jones could have actually uh, won, but he did not play that fight uh, correctly. So, yes, I have major, major question marks in regards to Cody Garbrandt's chin still. Uh, Figueredo is a, is a fighter that has power in his hands. Uh, he's a devastating striker. He's a well-rounded fighter. He's also extremely fast. So I don't know if Cody's going to be able to use that speed advantage to try to, uh, you know, kind of avoid being in a, a slugfest or not even a slugfest, just, uh, you know, a proper fight. If these guys go at it, uh, just, just, just enough, it's just going to take one shot to put Cody out, okay? So uh, I hate to say it because you guys know I am a Cody fan. Uh, I'm a longtime Cody Garbrandt fan, but I have no faith in his chin, and I think that Davison Figuero Figueredo can get a knockout over Cardi Garbrandt here. Out of Figgy's 22 victories, he has finished eight of them via KO slash TKO. Not so much recently has he been getting those knockouts, but trust me, he has that power. And let's not forget what he did to Joseph Benavides back in 2020, uh, what he did to John uh, Moraga back in the day. Uh, Joseph Morales, uh, Morales, not the most recognizable name, but still starched him in the second round. I know for a fact that Figgy has fight-ending power, even up in the bantamweight division. 
especially when we're, we're talking about testing a guy like Cody Garbrandt's chin. So uh, th- that's that's where I'm going with this fight. I- I'm just making it simple. I know a lot of people are going to kind of be in agreement. I think F- Figgy gets the knockout here. Um, now, to play devil's advo- ad- advocate, if Cody's chin somehow has been starting to get a second life to it and he's able to avoid being tagged uh, too harshly, if he could use his footwork and, and mix things up, uh, he did look good against Brian Kelleher, and you still have to understand that before his chin detonates, he is always live to knock out the opposition, okay? So I'll just give you that. Cody has fight ending power in his hands, and if if they clash right off the rip before Figgy can touch him on the chin, Cody can have that opportunity to knock him out as well, okay? Now, I want to let you guys know I will 100% be doing a prop video for this card. There's not even a question about that, so we'll have an in-depth prop video we're strictly talking about where who we're picking to win the fight and by what method here and then we're, we're analyzing these money lines okay so figgy opened up as a minus 350 on my bookie touched 375 and now it's going the opposite way it's going back uh towards cody's way which it's an extremely high line so i mean uh, i mean some minuscule movement there um I, i'll tell you what i i just don't have the faith in cody to even really say, sit here and tell you guys, oh, there's more value on the on the underdog line here. I don't have the faith in his chin. Uh, I liked how Figgy looked in his last fight, and I think that he comes into this fight really bringing the pressure and just getting the job done. So it's a high line, yes, but I I, I would rather be even on the high line side on Figgy. And it's crazy too, just to take this into consideration so you guys understand. Um, well, Figgy will have a two and a half inch reach advantage as well, even though he's bumping up in weight. You know, he's a little shorter, but has those long, long arms there. He's 36 years old, still looks to be in phenomenal shape. And Cody's the 32 year old fighter that has uh, the, the the weather and tread on him. Okay, so uh, for all you young fighters that, that are coming up in the game or just for anyone that's just trying to understand this, not that you guys don't already, but you know, it makes a big difference how you take care of yourself throughout your career. If you're sparring extremely hard, like we know Cody was doing for years, if you guys haven't uh, known about the the tales of of him over at Team Alpha Male, him and TJ Dillashaw knocking each other on practice all the time. Uh, Cody got into boxing from a young age as well. He obviously sparred way too hard. He took too much damage. And obviously, let me also mention uh, uh, TJ Dillashaw devastated his chin and and TJ was on uh, EPO and all that type of stuff too. So it's, it's, it's just a sad situation there but let, let's see if cody can somehow revive his chin and, and hang in this fight but i got figgy getting that first round ko slash tko there he is jimbo miller as we talked about it earlier fought on ufc 100 uh, where he defeated mac danzig fought on ufc 200 where he defeated takanori gomi and now he'll be fighting on ufc 300 and he'll be taking on king green uh this is a Perfectly made match. Both these fighters uh, have polarizing names in the game, right? Isn't that crazy? We're kicking this card off. The first two fights of the event are like two guys squaring off against each other that have huge names and just a perfect matchmaking. Like I said, both these guys up in age, but really still fighting at a high level. Now, the main thing that sticks out to me as we jump into this fight is that Bobby Green is coming off a, an absolutely brutal lost to J- Jalen Turner. If you guys forgot about what happened there, the referee fell asleep at the wheel or he had some some real beef with King Green because, uh, I mean, that, that fight should have been stopped almost five, 10 seconds uh, before it was finished. And if you don't realize, for those of you guys that haven't been in a fight, five seconds is a long time when you're in a fight, five, 10 seconds. I mean, that, that's a, <laughs> that's a, a really, really long time for, for Turner to have landed the damage that he did. He had him flattened out. Um, before that, uh, he did have that knockout victory over Grant Dawson. It was very strange. Before that, he submitted Tony Ferguson, the shell of Tony Ferguson. Um, I mean, he, he was looking good here, you know, just to, to talk about these these three fights. You know, I'm not going to uh, not give him too much merit there. Even the Jared Gordon fight, he was looking good before the headbutt. And before that, though, he was brutally knocked out by Drew Dober. Uh, he was knocked out by Islam Makashev. I mean, he, his chin is weathered, okay? So that's the thing that really stands out to me. He's 37 years old, and specifically coming off the loss that he's coming off of uh, against Jalen Turner, who we will be talking about later. Jim Miller is an absolute sniper. He knows how to land the mark, and if he touches Bobby Green, I think that Bobby Green can crumble here. Um, As of recently, Jim Miller, on a two-fight winning streak, arguably 
could have won the the third before that against Alexander Hernandez. It was a very close fight. If he would have won that fight, he would have been on a one, two, three, four, five, uh, six fight winning streak. And a lot of people did have him winning that Hernandez fight, but he looked stellar against Gabriel Benitez, got the submission there in the third round. He definitely still has a lot to offer to the game. And uh, I'm going with Jimbo here. I'm going with Jimbo. I think that just the durability issues of Bobby Green are, are what what's really making me uh, scared to 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 go on his side here. Uh, even if you take a look at Miller's recent losses, I mean, he at least he's he's holding up in there, man. He's not getting finished. He hasn't been finished all the way uh, since 2018, where he was submitted by the submission goat and Charles Oliveira. Uh, he was knocked out against Dan Hooker. That was back in 2018 as well. It was a long time ago. I mean, he, he's been durable, man. He's eaten shots. And if Bobby Green's going to have success, though, I don't really see him getting the knockout. I think that he could win a decision here with his speed, but his chin has to hold up. And if he's hitting in all cylinders, he could potentially style on Jim Miller and uh, just have that speed advantage. Uh, both men with, with an even reach. Initially, I was thinking that Bobby Green would have had a little bit of a reach advantage, but it's not the case. So uh, Miller has excellent footwork. And um, I, I got to go with Jim, Jim Miller to get another victory on uh, the century mark here. So that, that, that's what I'm doing, man. I'm a huge Jim Miller fan as well as Bobby Green's, but still, uh, we're, we're going for some early dog action. Jim Miller uh, opened up as a plus 160 on my bookie. He's now a plus 150. Uh, some, some slight line movement there. A little action coming in on Jim. Nothing really to talk about. Uh, I would say the value is definitely on Jim Miller here. Uh, I wouldn't be targeting Bobby Green at 2-1 to one odds personally. I understand if some of you guys are on the green side, I understand it. Uh, that This is a close fight for me. Bobby Green, if if his chin ho is holding up and he's hitting on all cylinders, he's he, he's very fast with his hands, great head movement. And he could, he could take over this fight in that in that regard if things are working for him well. But I think they're going to clash. I think this is going to be a real uh, fan-pleasing type of affair. And I think that there's going to be some big shots landed. And I just don't trust Bobby Green to hold up. So I'll take Jim Miller by finish. Could be a late finish. Maybe a submission too. Maybe he hurts him and subs him. I mean, Jim Miller is an excellent BGJ player as well. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Jiu black belt. And um, I will take Jim Miller to get a finish Within the 15 minutes, it could be later on in the fight, and it could be in a variety of ways, but watch that knockout potentially to land. Another legendary name here early on in the card. Got a tip my hat to Jessica Andraj. Uh, she's taking on Marina Rodriguez, who's, who has also carved out a solid name in the game for her. Uh, but but Andraj, a real legend, uh, future Hall of Famer and all that. So uh, excellent matchmaking here. Um, this is a fight that's really hard, hard to call. There's a lot of moving parts that balance each other out. We'll go over some of those. Uh, but if you're having a tough time uh, on which side you want to be for this fight, one thing that might help you uh, ch choose that side is, uh, you know, as I'm breaking down fight tape on Marina Rodriguez from her last fight against Michelle Waterson, listening to Waterson on the stool in between rounds one and two before she got finished there in the second round, that might help you lean towards Marina Rodriguez's way. I mean, she put on a masterclass in the rematch there against Michelle Waterson. The elbows, the knees, uh, the precision in her hands. She's such a, a nasty striker, especially for women's mixed martial arts. Uh, you guys know the real question mark in regards to her game is, is uh, you know, her grappling, her takedown defense. And then also, don't forget, she was knocked out by Amanda Lamos late in, in that fight there in the third round. And we know that Andraj has serious power. Uh, so either of these women can potentially get a knockout. Um, but But I'll tell you what, Marina Rodriguez... She is getting up there in age. She's 36 years old, but I, I think that she's really starting to put it together, if you ask me. Now, the route to victory for Andraj will be if she can land one of those power hooks, which I still would will favor Marina Rodriguez in the striking department. Uh, but if it, the real avenue will be if Andraj can get her down to the mat, get in her guard and, and really rain down some nasty ground and pound or use takedowns to solidify rounds. Um, I'll tell you what, though. I was initially on Andraj, but... Like I said, I think that I think that Marina Rodriguez is hitting on all cylinders right now. I like the fact that she's going to have that length advantage on the feet. And I think it's much more likely we see Marina Rodriguez land a fight ending shot on the feet than Andrade. I, I do. Andrade has been hit before. She's been tagged. She's been finished. Let's not forget uh, some of the losses that she's taken. And you guys know I've always been someone that that's been uh, shouting from the rooftops that she's only lost to the the highest of level of competition. But still, the chin has been tested. The Aaron Blanchfield loss does not look as good these days after the performance Blanchfield just put on. Uh, she she was knocked out by uh, Jan, who we'll be talking about in a little bit. Uh, she was uh, finished 
uh, violently down in the map by Shevchenko. Uh, she was knocked out uh, by Zhang. Uh, you know, she's so, I mean, she has a little bit of a track record of, of being finished uh, standing and just Marina, just understand Marina Rodriguez is a bona fide finisher. Okay. She's one of the nastiest strikers. Again, I want to emphasize one of the nastiest technicians in all of women's mixed martial arts in regards to the striking came into MMA with that, uh, that, that striking background there. So, I am going to be taking Marina Rodriguez. I think you guys are going to think I'm crazy, man. I think that this card's going to deliver in a major way. And I'm, I'm kind of edging Marina Rodriguez getting a finish here uh, due to strikes. A first round knockout, second round knockout. Again, some of you guys might think I'm crazy, especially for a woman's strawweight bout. So I don't say it with a, a lot, an extreme amount of confidence, but I still think that Marina Rodriguez does enough to get the job done in this fight. Even if it goes to the judges' scorecards, because you guys know how the judges are scoring these fights nowadays. Even if Andrade gets some takedowns, she better be doing some serious damage because Marina Rodriguez will be doing some serious damage as the beginning of these rounds kick off and they are standing. Okay, so I switched my pick. We'll see how that ages here. Uh, the odds on this fight are pick them. Okay, so you're picking your poison here, and I'm picking the poison of Marina Rodriguez. Okay, I mean, uh, pretty much identical on. Uh, on bet online, Marina Rodriguez is a slight underdog. She's at even odds right now. So uh, maybe a very minuscule lean towards Andrade's way. Andrade is actually the younger fighter at 32 years old compared to Marina Rodriguez is 36. But Rodriguez is in phenomenal shape. I don't really see her slowing down going into this huge event where I think she comes in in the best shape of her life. And I expect her to be more prepared than ever. So give me Marina Rodriguez to get the job done inside the distance. I think she finds that finish and she can get it in a variety of ways. It might be a knee coming up the middle in the clinch, cracking Andrade, uh, using that length. You know, and, and Andrade is short, man. Uh, that, that head is not too far above the mat. Marina Rodriguez can get her knees up there very easy. It might come via knee, uh, could come via some nasty elbows, uh, could be a kick, her hands. She could set it up in a variety of ways. Uh, this is going to be a phenomenal fight. This fight has chaos written all over it, taking place in the lightweight division, the number 10th ranked. Lightweight Jalen Turner taking on the number 13th ranked lightweight Hanato Moicano. You guys know we just cashed in on Moicano in his last fight against Drew Dober. Uh, but I'm going to be very clear right off the rip. Okay, this is uh, Jalen Turner is not Drew Dober. We know that Drew Dober is a phenomenal fighter, excellent striker. But I think that Jalen Turner is one of the more underrated fighters in the game, I would say right now. Okay, you, you understand that he's lost. Uh, two of his last three fights, they were both via split decision. Uh, this is a fighter that I think has a lot more potential to keep this fight standing than a Drew Dober. Okay, so Hanato Moicano is 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 the type of fighter, you know, really over the last couple of years, he's taken advantage uh, of stylistic matchups. Okay, so first and foremost, Brad Riddell, uh, a Muay Thai fighter that was on the verge of retirement before he ever even stepped in the cage there. He was trying to make a return back to the UFC, didn't even make the walk. Uh, Drew Dober, again, struggles down in the mat. Um, he was destroyed by RDA, but let's also understand that he took that fight on short notice. But the way he was ragdolled was alarming in that fight. Um, submitted Alexander Hernandez, uh, not not too high in Hernandez there. Um, submitted Jai Herbert, a kickboxing fighter that, that uh, you know came into MMA and he's putting it all together, but still um, brutally was knocked out by Rafael Faziv. Uh, submitted Demir Hasnovic. That's a fighter that has uh, very questionable grappling. If you remember how that fight went, it was kind of comical. If you remember how that uh, went down where he submitted him and then he was saying, you know, I want to keep fighting. And then Demir said, oh, you shouldn't have submitted me. But just, just understand that. And I just want to also mention he was knocked out by the Korean zombie, knocked out by Jose Aldo. That was a huge fight for him at the time. He absolutely caved in. I have major concerns about uh, his striking defense. He gets tagged up at times. And you saw it in the Dober fight, man. He was really, really... Uh, just relying on, uh, he was praying and relying on getting down, getting that fight down to the mat. And if he didn't, I think we know how that fight was going to go. And fortunately enough for him, he was getting those takedowns. Uh, but I have a feeling it's going to be a lot more difficult for him to get those takedowns against Jalen Turner. Jalen Turner is also just 28 years old. Okay. So he's just getting better and better, has a huge frame for the division. He's a tech technician on the feet. I see him stuffing takedowns, hurting Hanato Moicano. And you guys heard it. Heard it from me here again. I'm I'm taking another finish here. Listen, I'm not saying every one of these fights are going to be finished, but when I analyze these these fights, that's where I'm going to go with them, and I think I'm going to be right 
on a lot of these fights. I'll be right a lot more than I'm wrong. I think we're going to see a lot of finishes early on in this card. I think this is going to be a finish here. I think Honata Moicano is not going to be able to withstand the onslaught for, from Turner as he's just putting it on him. And I think that Honata Moicano is going to be diving for takedowns. And I just, I, I don't have enough faith in him controlling Jalen Turner down on the mat for for 15 minutes, okay? And, and even if he wants to try to go that route, it, it's it's a tough route to go these days if you want to win a decision regardless. So even if, in that regard, I, I would still pick Jalen Turner to win the fight via decision. So I'm, I'm all over the Turner side here. Uh, Mike Connell's a funny dude. I, I enjoy uh, listening to him get on the mic. And you know, before we dive into this betting line, it's like, I've been preaching this for for years. For those of you guys that see me doing interviews with the fighters, which we will start doing down the line again, and uh, there's a lot of big things coming with this channel. Stay tuned. I'm gonna I'm gonna amp things up again. But you guys remember, I was constantly asking these fighters, why are they not hopping on the mic? Why are they not calling their shots? I mean, I was one of the first ones to be speaking going nonstop about that. Luckily, we see the broadcast team kind of pushing that these days too. Why don't these fighters call out their next op opponent, make some noise? It's like they don't know that these little things that they could just do will help them make so much more money. Okay. So I, I admire that in money Moicano because he's making himself more money. He's getting an opportunity now to fight on UFC 300. He's getting these opportunities just by talking a little shit, man. Come on. It's easy. All right. And it's going to be, it's as easy as it's going to be for Jalen Turner. All right. Jalen Turner, a, he opened up as a minus 260 in my bookie. Uh, now a minus 250, a little up and down here, a little, a little LU action, 270 back up to the 250. Um, I still would rather be in the Turner side. Uh, that That's kind of how I'm analyzing this fight. I mean, I would like to have the line a little lower, obviously, but I, I, I want to make sure I'm clear on letting you guys know my confidence in Turner here. Not really crazy about the value on Moicano. Uh, I just don't think Moicano is going to be able to use the grappling. Now, think about this too, real quick before we leave this fight. I mean, uh, Jalen Turner just battled it out with uh, Mateus Gomrat, and that was a very close fight, a split decision fight. A lot of people thought Turner won that fight. I have Gomrat's grappling much higher, uh, maybe not much higher, but higher than Moicano. Uh, when you take into consideration the pressure he could put on with his wrestling and, and the pace, the cardio and the pace and all that, I think Gomrat is a, is a much more dangerous fighter in that regard. And some people thought Turner won that fight. I just... Uh, you know, Moicano, also a teammate of Gamrat, uh, training at American Top Team. So he'll have that that similar game plan and he knows what to expect. But Turner, uh, this dude is sharp, man. And Turner will have a five inch reach advantage. Uh, he's four inches taller. Uh, he has almost what, a three and a half inch uh, advantage in his legs. Watch those knees. Watch those those little calf kicks. Watch him to just pick apart Moicano as he keeps it standing. What's up, you guys? L check me out right here. You guys, if you sign up to Bavada.lv with my referral link, okay, you're going to get a sick bonus into your account as you kick off, all right? And I'm going to give you UFC 300, uh, my official plays. I'm going to give you them completely free. Don't hesitate, man. Reach out to me. It's going to be a solid night. I'm telling you guys, you have a nice little uh, new sports book account rolling and you guys will turn you whatever money you start off with. You're going to you're gonna flip that, triple it, whatever. Reach out to me. I'm telling you, man, we'll, we'll, we'll have some fun with this. If you want to sign up to Bavada.lv, reach out to me, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, or email, and I will give you my referral link and I'll answer any questions you have about the, the site. Let's get things rolling. Come on. Now, you know, we had to have Diego Lopez on this fight card. Uh, it makes it that much more exciting. One of the uh, rising stars in the game uh, has all the talent in the world. I mean, I, I don't want to slight him in, in that regard, but more of a fighter that just brings it and he's more of a, a fan friendly type of fighter, even though his ceiling is high. Uh, but not as high as some of the other top prospects in the game. He's taken on Sadiq Yusuf here. Yusuf, 30 years old, the number 13th ranked featherweight, coming off a very tough loss. If you guys remember that, that fight uh, was a crazy one against the legend Edson Barbosa. Uh, did so much damage to Barbosa early, but then eventually he gassed out, he broke down, and Barbosa had his way in that five-round fight here. I do have major question marks in regards uh, to the cardio of Yusuf. You know, as this fight goes to the later rounds, I think that Lopez will be the much more fresher fighter. I think he will be much more game. Um, I, I do think that Yusuf has a potential to to end this fight on the feet with his striking early on. He'll have the better striking, I would say, but the unorthodoxness of Lopez is going to be a problem. Uh, if this fight goes down to the mat, it's definitely going to benefit him. I think that Lopez is going to want to clinch up and make this an ugly fight and, and really close the distance uh, in, in, in order to have success in this fight. Uh, you know, there's a fight that I want to bring up. If you guys remember, when he fought on Dana White's Contender Series back in 2018, I believe that may have been 
the first season. It was one of the initial seasons of the show. And that fight that he had against Mike Davis, I remember instantaneously watching that fight and saying, both of those guys are UFC caliber fighters. And not only just UFC caliber fighters, those are top 15 that's top 15 type of talent. And uh, I, I stand behind that. I think that we're, we're starting to see that uh, Mike Davis still has a little bit more work to do, but he's a stud. Um, he got the better of Mike Davis. He came into that fight as an underdog and he got the better of him there. Okay. So uh, the, the two real, the, the two big losses that he had was against Arnold Allen and Edson Barbosa, two respectable fighters. Uh, the other loss was early on in his career, 30 years old. He's still a prime fighter. And I'm sure after taking that, that la last loss, He's going to have a fire really lit under him, but check out my boy Diego here. Diego, a, a lifelong uh, mixed martial artist, right? You see him there squaring up. This dude fights like it, man. When, when he's in the cage, this is a dude that just moves very fluidly. He's comfortable anywhere the fight goes, uh, but he's hitting on all cylinders right now. But I just want to also bring up, he does have a couple questionable losses, okay? He's been knocked out once before. It was a while ago. It was back in like 2018. Took place over in Chechnya, uh, over at, at uh, an ACB event. Uh, it was against a fighter that's resume is, eh, that's all right, you know? So not not really that impressive. So you keep an eye on that, but you fight long enough. I mean, anyone can get knocked out, right? I mean, so this, you know, Lopez has been putting in work. He already has 29 pro fights at the age of 29. So... I don't know. Maybe we don't. We we're not too harsh on him there. But yes, we do have to understand that Yusuf will be dangerous on the feet in this fight. It's a three rounder as well. If Yusuf can keep this fight standing and have success from the outside, working the the, the calf kicks and and using his punches, he could definitely have success in this fight. But I'm gonna I'm gonna lean towards the Diego Lopez's uh, way here. I'm gonna I'm gonna pick him to win this fight. And I don't know. I guess I'll bring this up. I used to say, I'm going to edge this fighter. I'm going to edge this fighter. And I got a message from somebody telling me that I really, sh I shouldn't say that. I guess there's an alternative meaning to that. Never knew it, but I guess I'll avoid saying that. So uh, I'm going to side with Diego Lopez here. Uh, not a, an extremely strong lean. I think that Sadiq Yusuf is live here uh, to, to have success in this fight. He's a slight underdog at plus 110, open up as a plus 135. Maybe if you're grabbing him at that 135, there was some value there. Uh, but as it starts to close, close up there, then maybe we're talking about value on Lopez's line still because I, I do slightly edge him. And right now, you can get Diego Lopez still as low as minus 130. It's not really a bad line there where it's at. All right, so you can catch that minus 130 line right now. I'll, I'll just, I'll put myself on the Diego Lopez side, side of things, even with the line. I like him. I think he rises to the occasion. We've seen that already from him early on in his career. He rises to the occasion and uh, the crowd will be going crazy and he, he'll deliver. I think that he'll have ice water pumping through his veins and... Uh, that's a f another fun fight. Give me Diego Lopez. <laughs> I'm going to give you guys all these finishes here. Give me Diego Lopez to get a late sub. Could be early too, but give, let me, let, let's get Lopez by a sub. His jiu-jitsu is nasty. And uh, if Yusuf slows down and this fight hits the mat, I mean, uh, Yusuf has never been submitted before. So that would be a major accolade, a major feather in the cap of Lopez, but would not be surprised if he, if he does pull that off. So this fight's taking place in the women's bantamweight division. Kayla Harrison making her UFC debut, looking to drop down to 135 pounds for the first time in her career. I'm interested to see how the weight cut goes for her. She's taking on Holly Holm, uh, future Hall of Famer, legend in the game. I really like this fight. I'll tell you guys that right now, okay? You guys know I'm a fan of all mixed martial arts, and I say this all the time. I, I really enjoy watching a high-level women fight some of you guys don't like it as much as i do i like it so i love this this debut for kayla harrison taking it holly home um kayla harrison fighting as high as 155 pounds throughout her career that's a 20 pound weight difference she carries a lot of muscle though i think that she she might actually look good at 135 pounds just chill out on the protein shakes and chill out on the weight lifting and uh you know maybe the, the cut won't be that bad harrison who already had such a, a decorated uh, judo resume as she worked her way into the sport of MMA, uh, teams up with the American top team over in Coconut Creek, uh, a perfect matchup there. Uh, obviously, but when you have that type of recipe put together, uh, you're going to have a lot of success. Uh, and that's what she's had throughout her career. Uh, I mean, her career has gone very, very well, uh, just losing once. And the fighter that she lost to, she had already two victories over her uh, initially. And uh, that was uh, Larissa Pacheco, who, what a shame that the, the UFC didn't keep their hands on her. If you remember, she was in the Ultimate Fighter a long time ago. She lost a split decision fight on the show, I believe, to uh, Macy Chase on, who's been looking really good. Uh, Larissa Pacheco is the real deal. And uh, so, so don't put her under the fire too much for taking that loss. But uh, th that, that should 
continue to motivate Harrison. She's 33 years old, which is, you know, she still has some, uh, some mileage left on the vehicle. I think she has a nice little run left at her in the UFC. I'm just really interested to see how the weight cut's going to go. And if you're not up to date with what Kayla Harrison's about, I mean, we're talking about a two-time gold medalist in the Olympics uh, back in 2012 and 2016. Over there, there in London and Rio de Janeiro, uh, I mean, she's uh, she has all types of medals in the Pan American Games, Pan American Championships, all golds everywhere. Uh, IJF, IJF Grand Prix, World Juniors. I mean, she's just I can imagine her trophy room. That this girl is the real deal, and uh, I think that her pressure and her grappling is just going to be a little too much for the aging Holly Holm. Uh, I don't really like the way that Holly looked in, in that last fight. Now that fight was overturned, but if you guys remember, she was finished by Myra Bueno Silva and uh, the, the pace was kind of pushed to her in that fight. And I, I just, I think that age is starting to catch up with Holly. Okay. Now Holly 42 years old, she might be able to get away with her age a little bit more than other fighters. Cause she's an absolute professional and takes such good care of her body, but 42 is still 42. And when you're getting matched up against a fighter, that's a lot more physically strong than you 33 years old. She just has so much more going for her. Uh, and Kayla Harrison, uh, just as far as her frame, her strength, uh, her youth, I think that those are the factors that are going to play a big deal. And if you're on the Holly side, I think you you got to crack her with a nice head kick or something and shake things up because Kayla's just going to continue to march forward. And even though we talked about that not being the most favorable style for the judges scorecards, I think she's really going to be coming forward to like the point where she's going to get takedowns and she's just going to take control of this fight. So uh, I am on Kayla Harrison here. I would love to see Holly Holm keep this fight competitive and and for this to be an exciting one, um, you know, to play devil's advocate. I mean, not that I'm really seeing that route, but if Holly could have success stuffing takedowns. Um, she, she's very polished in all avenues of the game. Maybe she could stuff some takedowns, work her way off the cage, uh, you know, spin out and she could use her striking to outpoint Kayla Harrison. Maybe the weight cut for Kayla Harrison affects her performance as well. Those are other things you could look at there, but, um, I'm kind of going with that, with the masses here. I just, I got to go with my gut here. I just think that Kayla Harrison is going to be a problem. And if she really hits this weight cut nice and she does it smoothly, I think it's, could be something that's really good for her. Uh, moving forward. I think she should settle in at this weight, uh, get get that muscle off you, and maybe her cardio won't even be that bad. Uh, Kayla Harrison opened up on my bookie at minus 475. She's now at minus 550. That line's a little too high for me. I think there's more value uh, on a Holly Holm underdog odds, uh, excuse me, on a Holly Holm underdog line, especially when you're seeing it as high as plus 370 on some of these books. Uh, it's 350 on Bovada right now. I would argue to you that there's more value on, on that line there just because it is still a women's mixed martial arts fight. If she can keep the fight standing, I don't know. I don't really want to trust a woman's fighter just to pressure and grapple and, and hold the other fighter down with the judges these days as well. But all in all, I think that Kayla Harrison gets the job done. And it, it is also likely she gets a finish. Uh, although I will say she wins a decision. I want to give you guys too many finishes, but this fight can be finished. Uh, we saw Holly again, just finished in her last fight. I think that Holly might get caught in a sub here. I think that we might see her head extremely red and we might see her getting squeezed and, and see that head looking like it's about to pop like a pimple and we might see her tap out and see her breathing heavy, heavily all frustrated. Could easily see that, but eh, we'll go decision there with Kayla Harrison. I don't want you guys getting too upset with me with too many uh, finishing uh, finishing uh, methods here for these, these victories. Aljo looks to make his debut up in the 145 pound weight class, taking on Calvin Cater. This fight should be fun. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of you guys are are mistaken and actually think that Aljamain Sterling is the greatest bantamweight champion of all time without really diving in uh, to his his title reign. Uh, hopefully, that's not upsetting you guys too much. Relax, guys. Relax. You guys are entitled to your opinion. Uh, but you know the bantamweight the, the, the bantamweight division as far as the goat goes, uh, it is up for debate. I, I understand. Uh, there, it's not like other weight classes where you really have someone that stands out. And Sterling has has had a lot of success. Okay. Um, you guys know there's some asterisks next to some of the performances for me, but I actually really like Sterling. All right. Just so you guys know that I actually think he's a, a cool dude. All right. So, um, I, I like this move up to 145 pounds. Uh, I think it was the right move. You guys know that his best friend, uh, Marab are pretty much his best friend, I assume. Right. I mean, they're, they're really tight. He's making his run towards the belt right now. So it's nice that Sterling steps to the side. Uh, he's up in age right now. He has a name for himself in the game and he doesn't have to do the, the, the weight cut and all that. So a smart move for him, if you ask me, especially coming off that that knockout loss that he just took to Sean O'Malley. Uh, that that was a little weird 
as far as I'm concerned. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sean O'Malley's a nasty striker, but the way that he he walked into those shots and, and how easily he dropped, I don't know. Uh, maybe the weight cut had a little something to do with that too. I don't know. Um, he carries a lot of muscle. He was big for that weight class. Maybe he, he'll be, oh, I actually expect him. I do expect him to be a little bit more sturdy and durable up in this weight division. And, um, you know, but let, let's be honest about Aljo. Aljo is really a grappling based fighter. Okay. Um, I think that Calvin Cater is going to get the better of the striking exchanges here. Uh, Calvin has a one inch reach advantage, not much going on there, uh, but he is about four inches taller. He's the longer fighter. He's the bigger fighter. He's, he's a natural featherweight. We're going to see how Aljo looks up at this weight class and uh, on the feet. Calvin Cater has some nasty boxing. He has some underrated boxing and people are being a little harsh on him right now because he's had some lackluster performances. I understand that. But just remember when Calvin is hitting on all cylinders, he has a nasty jab. He has nasty boxing and he can easily touch Aljo up in, in this fight here. So um, we'll get to my, my pick here in a second. Uh, but you know, let, let's just go over what Calvin's been doing as of recently. This is a fighter that has 30 professional fights. He's 36 years old and has some serious mileage on him. There's no question about that. Really all started with that Holloway loss and which, what was one of the most brutal losses we've ever seen. Uh, too bad that fight wasn't stopped earlier for him, but he did bounce back with the victory over Giga Chikazi. It was crazy. It was about a year uh, to date from that loss. And uh, that that shows you the mindset a guy like Calvin has, okay? To take that loss to Holloway and then bounce back and get a victory over Giga, which you guys don't don't forget what Giga's doing. Giga is a stud, and he went out there, he pressured him, and he got the better of him. Lost to Josh Emmett. That was a split decision loss, if you guys forgot. And Josh Emmett is a wrecking ball, okay? And then he's coming off that loss against Arnold Allen, and, and he injured his knee there. So we'll see how he looks in this fight. Uh, I think I'm showing my cards here a little bit. I am on Calvin Cater. I think that he's live to get a knockout in this fight. I have some question marks about Sterling, uh, just the way he was just finished against Sean O'Malley. Okay, Calvin's a much bigger dude than a Sean O'Malley. He, he might have more pop in, it, in his his hands. Um, you know, Calvin's a guy that has finished 10 of his 23 victories via knockout. He has solid boxing. Let's not forget, I know him and Rob Font haven't been having the best performances, but we still know that New England cartel uh, does their thing over there. So, I, I just don't trust Sterling to get takedowns and really use his grappling to have success, success in this fight. Cater has showcased a 91% takedown defensive rate All right, throughout his UFC career. This is a fighter that's hard to take down, um, you know, pushes the pace in the feet, landing 5.12 strikes per minute, but he does absorb a lot, absorbing 7.1. Those numbers are skewed due to the Holloway fight, but still uh, Sterling is not the worst striker. And there's potential that Sterling could crack him with a shot or something too. He's fast. He moves well, but I feel more comfortable being on Cater. I am on Calvin Cater to win this fight. And uh, don't be surprised if he gets a finish. I'll put that out there, but I'll take Cater by decision here. Uh, Cater is an underdog right now. He's a, a, a plus 115 underdog. Uh, this fight opened up right around Pickham. So action's been coming in on Sterling. I think people like the way that he's looking going into this fight. Um, but I think that Calvin shows up for a little a little redemption spot here. Give me Calvin. Don't be shocked if he gets a knocked out. Maybe. We'll see how that goes. But again, Sterling should be a little bit more durable, not cutting as much weight. But I'll take Calvin Cater via decision. Major implications for the light heavyweight division here. Yuri Prohaska taking on Alexander Rakic. Uh, Prohaska, the former champion. Okay, let, let's remember now. Prohaska... Just took a, a knockout loss to Alex Pereira. Some people felt the fight was stopped a little early, but still, that was a fight he, that he was going into off a year and a half uh, layoff, uh, you know, in between his last fight. And he had a devastating injury, right? If you guys remember, he had that devastating uh, injury to his shoulder. And uh, a lot of people thought he would, some doctors, I should say, or some people speculated he was going to be out for a lot longer than he was. Uh, he made a quick return based off the details on his injury. Uh, you have to take that into consideration. I don't think that was uh, Yuri Prohaska hitting on all cylinders. Also note, Alexander Rakic is coming into this fight in a similar situation, right? So his last fight uh, was in um, in May. Yeah, about a, about a year layoff for him as well. Not as long, but uh, about a year layoff for him uh, when he injured his knee against Jan Blakovich, had that knee injury um, in the third round there. And let's be honest, though, Rakic was losing that fight. Uh, to uh, the former champion Jan Blakovich. Okay, he was a little bit of a step behind Blakovich in that fight. He was getting tagged up. Uh, now Prohaska has a different fighting style uh, than Blakovich. Prohaska is very unorthodox, and there's potential that he could land a big shot and get a knockout. Uh, but he also is lacking defensively. 
And I do think there's potential that Rakic could have success because of that. Rakic has a much, much more uh, disciplined and technical fighting style. Uh, you know, his, his hands will be up. Uh, chin will be tucked. He throws heavy leg kicks. Let's not forget what he did to Justin Ledette. Uh, who who Ledette is uh, was a fighter that had more of a boxing style. He's heavy on that that heavy on that front leg, and uh, Rakic absolutely chewed his legs up. Um, now we haven't seen a lot of knockouts from Rakic uh, throughout the years, but you know early on he had those two big knockouts. This, this was back in 2018 and 19 where he knocked out Jimmy Manoa and Devin Clark. That's when everybody thought he was just going to go out there and continuously knock dudes out, and then he kind of switched his fighting style where he's just kind of trying to outpoint guys. So I, I kind of wonder what version of him we're going to see here. I'm um, very, very torn on this fight. Again, I want to circle back to the point that, that Yuri has that unorthodox style and it leads him to having success in his fights. We've seen him hit some nasty knockouts and really just have his, his opposition scratch in their heads, but also it leaves him vulnerable to being countered. And I worry a little bit that Rakic can counter him and, and knock him out. Um, there's just so many question marks though, man. Rakic is coming off that knee injury, coming off a year layoff. Uh, Prohaska was coming off a huge layoff into his last fight, got finished early on. I don't know, man. This is one of the, one of the fights on the, this fight card that I, I really, I don't know where to go with this one, man. I'll be honest with you. Okay. So um, I'll say this much. I don't have a lot of confidence in, in the Prohaska pick, but I'm going to pick Prohaska because I'm a huge fan of his. I like Rakic a lot as well, but I haven't been the biggest fan of his fighting style as of recently. And I wasn't that impressed with how he looked against Jan Blakovich early on in that fight as well. Okay. So I'm going to say that Yuri bounces back with the victory. We also know that Yuri is an extremely motivated fighter. This dude is cut from a different cloth. I just hope that he's making intelligent decisions to fix up his flaws in his game. Okay. It's one thing to be extremely motivated and to be training nonstop and to be out in the woods and sleeping in a dark room and all that. But is he making the right changes to, uh, to, to shield the flaws in his game? Is he defensively, man? I don't know. And I don't expect him to change his style completely. He's going to have his hands down. Uh, but you know what, man, this dude is a stud. I hope he bounces back with the victory and I hope he makes another run at the title. So, uh, give me Yuri Prohaska. Okay, he opened up as a plus 115 on, on my book. He was an underdog. He's now a plus 105. Uh, he's a slight underdog, okay? So Rakic is the favorite here. Uh, Rakic is a minus 135 on my bookie right now. He's the slight favorite. Coming off a long layoff, coming off that knee injury. Let's see how his leg holds up as well. But Rakic may find a knockout in this spot. Prohaska may find a knockout in this spot. You're talking about two big-time uh, big time punchers in a, a up in the heavyweight division, the heavyweight division. But also note, as far as the finish finishing goes, uh, Prohaska with 19 knockouts uh, out of 29 victories, Rakic with the five knockouts. But we still know that it only takes one. Okay, it only takes one from a guy like Rakic. We know that. Okay, he hasn't always had the demeanor and and the the energy like to to, to display that. But if he shows up mentally ready to go, he can get a knockout here. But give me Yuri Prohaska. To get the job done, uh, we've seen Rakic knocked out one time in his career, and um, well, knocked out, and then that that isn't with an asterisk, right? Because that was against Jan Blakovich, and that was an injury, okay? But he was getting picked apart, so he's been been known to be a durable guy. Uh, tough one, tough one there, but let, let's go, with Yuri. Hey guys, if you could real quick, please go follow me on Instagram at MMA Fortune Teller underscore or on Twitter at the MMA Teller means a lot to me, guys. If you can, just uh, help me grow this thing over here. I'm really working on some things behind the scenes still, and it'd mean a lot to me if you guys could help uh, grow my brand. Please, just one click helps a lot. Oh, boy. Strap your seatbelt up here. Charles Oliveira, the number one ranked fighter, right? Remember now, of course, obviously you guys know this, but uh, I don't know like how the UFC does that. The number one lightweight fighter, but he's really the number two guy in the division, but you have the champion, then they go number one. I don't know why they do that. I don't know why they don't go champion number two, but I guess the number one contender they want to say or whatnot. Charles Oliveira, the former champion, he's taken on Armand Sarukian, a fighter that you guys know I've been very high on uh, for a long time now. This is a, a very fun matchup. I guess we'll, we'll kick things off talking about Charles Oliveira, who just had a beautiful bounce back victory over a common opponent of, of Darius, Darius just, excuse me, um, of Sarukian, which Sarukian just finished Darius as well. So take note of that. Before that, Oliveira uh, was submitted by Islam Makashev. He, he broke down in that fight, but Islam, uh, you know, number one pound for pound fighter in the world right now. Remember, Oliveira was on an absolute tear running through Chandler, Poirier, Gaethje. Uh, you could bring up the Ferguson and Lee fight if you want as well. I mean, he went on, on an absolute run, got his hands on the gold. I like the way he bounced back in that last fight after being finished, going out there and just 
showed up with the same confidence he always had back in the day. Um, Armand Sarukian, though, listen, I've been telling you guys that he was going to make a run at this title. All right. And, and, you know, the performance he just had over Benil Dariush was masterful. Uh, I, you guys know I had him winning that Mateus Gamrat fight, as did a, the majority, the majority of fight fans. That was a five round war. That was a win for him. He showcased that his cardio is ridiculous. Okay, this guy is in such phenomenal shape. He's very physically strong. Do I need to circle back and, and talk about his UFC debut where he was 22 years old, went to a decision with Islam Makashev and possibly tested him more than anyone that ever tested Islam uh, besides when Islam was knocked uh, unconscious there by the Brazilian, but way back in the day. But still, listen, Armand Sarukian's a stud. I think stylistically, this is a bad matchup for Charles Oliveira because Armand Sarukian has the grappling to avoid going down to the mat and... Charles is a dangerous striker too. He might find the market and, and get Sarukian out of there. But I think that Sarukian is going to break Oliveira down. Oliveira is a fighter that, yeah, he will go out there and finish you. And I think he's live to finish Sarukian here. He can finish anybody. And and if Sarukian makes a poor choice to try to use his wrestling good can go down to the mat, that could be a bad move because Oliveira can submit anybody, especially early on. He could, he'll, he'll reverse you. He'll latch onto your back and he'll finish you up. But Saruki, and if he fights an intelligent fight, I think that he'll break Oliveira down. And I think eventually he might get into a ground and pound type of situation later in the fight and smash Oliveira. We've seen Oliveira finish very often. We've seen him kind of give up in fights. I don't want to say give up, but you know what I mean? Kind of breaks down in fights. Okay. This is a guy that's been finished eight times. Okay. Out of nine losses, he's been finished eight times. I got Arm Armand Saruki and avoiding that, that early threat. And then breaking Oliveira down and getting a finish here. Another finish. I'm, I'm taking a Sarukian with the finish here. And Sarukian, this is going to be a coming out party for him. He's going to be uh, fighting for the belt here uh, very soon, one way or another. And I, I really want to see him against Islam Makashev. He was 22 years old at the time. Now he's 27. I would love to see him get a redemption chance. He took that fight on short notice too. So um, it's crazy. Now check this out though. Charles Oliveira opened up as a plus 155. We got big action coming in on Ar Armand Sarukian. Uh, Charles Oliveira was just recently a plus 180 on my bookie. I've seen him out there, plus 190 on some of these books, plus 185. I think the value is on Oliveira. I don't feel confident enough in, in Armand Sarukian to be targeting him as high as a minus 250 favorite. That's just too steep for me. Charles Oliveira is going to bring heavy pressure. He's nasty with his Muay Thai. He can land a strike. Uh, he, he's fluid with his fighting style. Even if you drop him or whatever, he's still dangerous down on the mat. Uh, he can go. He can fight on his feet. He could fight down on the mat. The value is on Charles Oliveira where this line stands right now. Uh, I would hope that a lot of action continues to come in on Charles Oliveira somehow if it reverses and I can get Sarukin at a better line. That's what I would kind of hope. But other than that, I'll be sit sitting back watching this fight. I have the under in this fight, under a one and a half rounds. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking this fight not completing the second round. I'm talking inside the distance, which whatever way you want to go. Uh, if you're going sub prop for Oliveira, knockout prop, this fight is not going to a decision in my, my view. So. Uh, I like Armand Sarukin to get the job done when it's all said and done, though. So I put this up on Instagram the other day, and uh, there was a couple of guys that I put in, in honorable mentions that I probably should have put on the graphic because I probably should have, should have had Kamzat Chimaev and Conor McGregor up in the mix uh, on the graphic as well. But I wanted to put some of these other dudes that maybe some of you guys forgot about, like Uriah Hall, after Uriah Hall landed that that knockout on the Ultimate Fighter. I mean, the hype was crazy back then when he was working his way into the UFC, uh, even though he lost the ultimate fighter to Gaslam, but still Kimbo, a lot of people were very hyped up on him, not really understanding how that was going to translate. But uh, uh, Umar Nurmagomedov, Brock Lesnar, Ronda Rousey, uh, like I said, uh, McGregor comes at Shemaev, uh, put Mursad Bektik up there. If you don't remember, Bektik was a highly, highly uh, regarded prospect coming into the UFC, training out of American top team. He was undefeated. <clears throat> so I'm talking about the biggest hype jobs. Uh, and it doesn't mean that they necessarily failed or whatever, just people that were fighters that were really hyped up. Uh, Mark Dia Casey, the bone crusher, when he bursted on the scene in, in the UFC, he was training with the American top team, knocking dudes out. People were so high on him. Uh, Alex Pereira with his kickboxing background came into the UFC. People got hyped up on him. Who, who am I forgetting? You guys tell me who are the most hyped up fighters? Uh, cause Bo, Bo Nickel is definitely uh, one of the most hyped up fighters. And I think it is, uh, warranted Bo Nickel with the wrestling background that he has. And then. Not just that, but the way that he's transitioned with his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu game and then his striking as well. Now, he's not a perfect fighter by any means, and I think that he will be vulnerable to fi fighting high-level fighters uh, that could strike, okay? We, he, you see his striking defense. Even when he's getting these knockouts as of recently, he's, his hands are a little down, and he's there to be countered, uh, but he's getting away with it. He's an explosive athlete. He, the way he moves, he gets away with it. He knocks these dudes out. Uh, but, you know, 
knocking out an undersized Val Woodburn and took that fight on short notice. Submitted Jamie Pickett. Pickett. I wasn't crazy about the way he had him in that arm triangle. And I don't know. I wish I could ask him because I'm kind of curious. I was kind of wondering, uh, you know, uh, a lot of um, high level jujitsu players would have uh, probably uh, advised or, you know, the real way you would go for that arm triangle uh, choke would be kind of, you know, scoot your legs off to the side and try to really crank down on that that way. And it was weird. It's like he wanted to sit in half guard and crank it from half guard. And I, and I guess some people like to go that route, but I don't know. I, I always would try to uh, scoot my hips out and go off to the side. And especially when, when he wasn't having success with it in that half guard position, I don't understand why he would didn't try to change it up and see if he can get it like that. So uh, that's one question I had from him. I didn't like the way Pickett survived that sub for as long as he did. Um, and then you want to talk about the Dana White's contender series performances. I mean, that was phenomenal against Donovan Beard and Zachary uh, Borrego, lower level fighters, but still the way that he did, moved out there, the way he snapped that triangle choke on roll into his back. That's high level shit, man. This dude's the real deal. Uh, the frame, he has everything. And then when it's all said and done, man, when, even if some of these fighters are going to be able to hang with him and, and make him really, uh, have to dig deep. This dude is such a phenomenal wrestler that he's going to break these guys. He's just going to go to the wrestling and he's going to have success and he'll dominate them down there. He'll win decisions like that anyway. All right. So you're going to have to knock this dude out. Okay. And, uh, you know, shout out to Cody. No, no disrespect to Cody Brundage. He follows me on IG. He likes to post and whatnot. He's a cool dude, but I don't see Cody doing it. Now, Cody is a hit and miss type of fighter. He shows up and performs differently every, every fight. Uh, he's coming off a knockout victory over Zachary Reese, a big prospect. Remember, he lost to Jacob Malkoon. That was a that was a like a DQ type of thing. Uh, got smashed by Malkoon. Um, I could see Nickel doing something similar similar to what Malkoon did, just taking him down and, and TKOing him down in the mat. I think that's the, what we're going to see here. Even though Brundage has, uh, I think he has like a junior college wrestling background. Uh, we see him taken down often. We see him on his back. I don't really see the wrestling skills that he has translating into the cage as, as well as I thought they would have. And Bo Nickel, Penn State, fucking All-American dude. He's going to rip Cody down, and I think he's going to smash him on the mat. Um, I think Bo Nickel is, is, I think Bo Nickel is going to be a superstar in the game. He's going to be like one of those dudes. You know when you watch ESPN and you have like the top tennis player or the top golfer, like these names that are just... They're such a dominant athlete and they are such, they have a professional back, like demeanor to them. You know what I'm saying? They translate well to like ESPN and, and, uh, the big, the big overall pitcher for sports. I think Bo Nickel is going to be that dude. I think he's going to be all over ESPN. If he gets his hand on hands on the gold, if he continues to, to have this undefeated run, he needs to work on a lot of things, but his work ethic is ridiculous. And he's shown some really early signs of picking up his striking. Um, you know, excuse me. He's shown signs to pick up striking very early on in his career at a high level. I like this dude. I think that when Bo Nichols 32 years old, another four years, poof. Um, I don't really like the fact that he's training up in Pennsylvania. They open up that other American top team up there. I wish he was just in Coconut Creek grinding over there, but uh, this dude is is a high Q fighter. He knows what he's doing better than I do. So um, yeah, Bo Nickel, obviously. And check this line out. It's ridiculous. He is as high as a, a plus. Uh, let's see here. He was as high as a minus, excuse me, not a plus as high as a minus 3,500. Okay. Over a 3,500, three, five, two, six. It's crazy. Okay. You got to put your house up to win a McDouble. All right. So whatever. Bo Nickel is going to get the finish. We'll talk about some prop bets. Maybe we can get a better line on, on a specific uh, first round type of finish there. He's going to get Brundage out of there within the first round. We got the BMF title on the line. Justin Gaethje is taking on Max Holloway as Holloway bumps up to the lightweight division. You know, I see people saying that, you know, Max Holloway is going to be a little undersized here. And I I guess that's somewhat true. I mean, he is a, a career featherweight fighter. I don't know, though, man. I always felt like he was such a, a, a such a rangy featherweight fighter that I thought he should have translated perfectly into the lightweight division, just like Dustin Poirier did, just like Conor McGregor did. Um but, but I understand what you're saying. I mean, Gaethje will have a one inch reach advantage here. He's just a little bit more dense, a little bit more solid. He's a proven lightweight fighter. He's been doing it forever. You think about the work he was doing it over at the World Series of Fighting. I've been a huge fan of his back from the World Series of Fighting days. He's doing backflips, knocking everybody out. Um, you know, if you, if you guys didn't know about Gaethje back then, I mean, I've, I've been on to him. I'm an old timer, man, but I, I've been on to Gaethje since he was just a young, hot prospect back then. I wanted him in the UFC way before he ever made it to the UFC. And uh, he's still fighting uh, at a very high level. Uh, just had two extremely impressive performances, of course, uh, you know, headlined by the, the Dustin Poirier knockout, getting redemption there. Looked great against Rafael Fazeev. I liked the way that he looked better as the fight progressed. 
Uh, and then he, you know, he fell short against Oliveira, looked great against Michael Chandler, was just really a step ahead of Chandler there. Uh, this could be a similar performance as to the Chandler fight where Gaethje's just a little bit of a step ahead. Uh, another fight that stands out to me when I'm, when I'm breaking down tape uh, for this matchup where I could see some similarities is like, uh, is the, the Volkanovsky fight. Some of these Volkanovsky's fight fights, the Poirier fight where you just seen Max Holloway a little bit of a step behind. And I know Max looked good in that, that one Volkanovsky fight, but Besides that, he's a little bit of a step behind. He looks so phenomenal against some of these other guys, but when when he fights those those real high level dudes, he's kind of just a little step behind in regards to the striking. I can see Gaethje kind of being a little bit ahead of him here. Um, I don't say that with an overwhelming amount of confidence. Holloway's thirty two years old, uh, coming off the Korean Zombie knockout, which it was what it was. Zombie was washed, and uh, I mean he got him out of there, but by the uh, before the end of the third round. So early in the third round, we got him out of there. I mean, it was what it was. Looked good against Arnold Allen. Uh, I mean, you think about the Calvin Cater fight, the Aya Rodriguez fight, the Arnold Allen fight. Those are fights that he gets so far out ahead. He just, the amount of strikes he could put out there, he could take over a fight as phenomenal boxing, some of the best boxing in the game. Um, both these fighters put such a high output out there, both up in the sevens uh, as far as landing per minute. Uh, Gaethje getting absorbed at 7.5. That could be a problem. Um, you know, I, I would like to see Gaethje fight a, a a safer type of style here where he could be a step ahead. But if he really wants to make this a brawl, uh, you know, you never know, man. He could get clipped by Holloway. Um, it'd be, we're, they're fighting with four ounce gloves and, and you never know, man. Holloway's not really like a one uh, a one shot type of striker. But still, I mean, he, his boxing is phenomenal. And you never know. We've, we've seen Gaethje crumble. Uh, but again, it gets high level competition. But we've seen him kind of crumble in some of those big fights and just. To, to circle back to some of those, of course, the Islam Makashev, the Charles Oliveira fight, uh, excuse me, not Islam. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Khabib, the Khabib fight, Charles Oliveira. He was submitted in both those, but remember he started to like have those deer in the headlights type of look. He was getting landed on a little bit and it was kind of like all over the place and was uh, flopping around before he got subbed. Uh, I don't know if Holloway can really do that to him, but you know, as we get over to the uh, betting line where Max Holloway is a plus 170. I say there's more value on the underdog spot here in Max Holloway. If Max Holloway comes in with his head on his shoulders and, and fights this fight, you know, the right way, he comes in with some training the right way and has a high fight IQ. I think he can have success in this matchup. Uh, but all in all, I am on the Gaethje side of things. I think I, I think I have Gaethje winning a decision. I think that's an absolute war. But similarly to that Chandler fight, I think Gaethje will just be a step ahead. But I, I don't feel comfortable and I wouldn't want to chalk up minus 240 on uh, Justin Gaethje here. I, I don't like minus 240 next to his name, next to a legend in Max Holloway, which if he could finally just get over that hump in these big fights against these legends and get a W, you know, if he can get that W up in the lightweight division, it'd be, it would be huge for his career. I would love to see Holloway settle in as a lightweight fighter. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see him cutting the weight, going down to the featherweight division. I know there's some new matchups and whatnot, but still, I want to see him fill up, man. And I'm curious to see how he looks on the scales. Give me Justin Gaethje via decision being just a little bit of a step ahead, similarly to that Chandler fight that he had. Now, this fight r reminds me a lot of Yoenny Young Jacek when she took on Karolina Kovacevic. If you guys remember, it was Poland versus Poland, uh, the two best fighters at that time in, in the division. Uh, these are the, the two best fighters, well, arguably the best two fighters around the division. There's, there's a couple other fighters that are, you know, you got to keep an eye on, but still. Uh, Wei Li Zhang taking on uh, Xiaonin Yan, both fighters representing China. Uh, Xiaonin Yan it could be live here to get a knockout. We've seen Zhang knocked out before. Of course, of course, the Rose Namajunas uh, head kick knockout. Um, she also she lost the Rose again in the rematch. Uh, besides that, though, she's been an absolute terror, and her other loss came way early on in her career. Uh, what she just went out there and did against Amanda Lemos was ridiculous, breaking all type of statistical records. Um, now. I think that that if you break down the tape on the Lamosh fight, I think that this fight is going to play out similarly to the Lamosh fight. I think that uh, I do have question marks in regards to Sean and Yan's grappling, especially compared to Zhang. Zhang's Zhang is the more complete fighter. Uh, you run the tape back on that Carla Esparza fight that took place back in 2021. I mean, she's had some years to work on things, but remember that uh, she was taken down in that fight, and, and that was an issue for her there. Uh, she lost to Marina Rodriguez, who's a stud striker, and then uh, she's been on a little two fight. A winning streak here, but the Mackenzie Dern fight doesn't look as good as it did at the time. I, and you guys know I've been warning you guys about Mackenzie Dern, but still. And then she knocked out Jessica Andrade, who we also just talked about. So listen, I'm going to make this simple here. 
We're going to get to the betting line here in a second. Um, we'll, we'll slide over there now, but I'm on Wei Li Zhang. I think that Wei Li Zhang is just phenomenal. She's a four to one favorite. That's a, it's a high line open up at minus three seventy five. I think that she resorts to the grappling and I think that she, she pretty much dominates this fight. She takes this fight over. All right. I, I think it's going to be similar to the Lamoche fight. And uh, that, that's where I'm going to go with it. Now, do I see value at, at four to one odds? I don't know. I mean, you guys know I parlayed her in her last fight. Uh, and it was it was nice. I was sitting at the bar just cruising as that two-team parlay hit. Um, but Sean and Yan is dangerous. And she could potentially land some big shots early on in this fight. As the fight progresses, that's where Zhang really will take over the fight. And it'll be more comfortable. The first round could be a little iffy. Uh, I'm on Wei Li Zhang. And... The line's a little high for my liking, but come on. What, what am I going to say? I'm on Zhang. It's a high line. Stay away from this fight. Just watch it or parlay Zhang, I guess. I don't know. Or maybe we'll, we'll talk some prop bets for this fight at the, in the prop edition video. Don't forget, if you want to work with me for my official plays that I'm targeting for this card, the spots where I really see some value that I'm looking to hammer in on, reach out to me. I'll send you over my pricing, and uh, I will send you over uh, a complete write-up for what we are targeting here, and you'll make some money. Let's get it. So I'll tell you what. As we get closer and closer to this main event matchup here, light heavyweight championship of the world on the line, Alex Pereira taking on Jamal Hill. The more I've been analyzing this fight, breaking down tape, seeing stuff online, I'm getting more and more amped up for this matchup here. I know some of you guys were hating hating it as far as being the main event for this UFC 300 card. People wanted more of an iconic figure to kind of headline things, but uh, this fight is going to be... Uh, it's, the, the, the fight world's going to be buzzing as these guys are coming out. I just made a funny... A uh, funny little Instagram reel poster. I'll show you guys real quick. But uh, I was saying this is how the crowd's going to be looking as Alex Pereira is walking out to the cage. And I got the music blasting. You guys see what song I chose. But uh, that's how the, the crowd's going to look when Alex Pereira's walk, making the walk to the cage and he's pulling that bow and arrow out and he's shooting at Hill. And then imagine once this fight kicks off, uh, we're very likely to see a knockout here. And you know there's a little bit of backstory too with Alex Pereira uh, having that connection to Glover Teixeira and them kind of brushing shoulders in the cage. It's just... Uh, you know, and Jamal Hill's really made a name for himself outside uh, just fighting in the cage. This guy's really becoming an inter an entertainer. Uh, he's coming off that Achilles injury, which we got to see how he looks out there. But this dude is a stud and he rises to the occasion. Now, Jamal Hill is not the most technical fighter. He's a fighter that really gets gets off and has a lot of success just based off his durability and just his uh, his athleticism and his movement. Doesn't really look like he's the most athletic, but he moves nice in there. And, um, you know, I could see him knocking out Alex Pereira. I could see him knocking out Alex Pereira. We've seen Alex Pereira just knocked out by Israel Adesanya with that counter. We've seen him wobble before and hurt. And um, he's very technical, but he's sometimes he's there to be hit. And sometimes we, we talked about this. Sometimes you see these these fighters that aren't as technical, but they're just, they move a little quicker with their hands down low and they, they get away with things a little bit more so. You know, that also being said, when, when fighters keep their hands down low and they're not as technical, sometimes the te the technical fighter gets off on them too. You know, if he comes in sloppily, we could see Alex Pereira counter him with a nice hook, just how he just did it to Prohaska in that last fight. Okay, so there's a lot of moving parts here. The things that I like about being on the Pereira side is that the longer the fight goes, I think Pereira gets the better of this fight with the, as he invests into the calf kicks and, and the leg kicks. Okay. Also with Jamal Hill having that injury and having that question mark there, that's something I worry about. If you're on the Jamal Hill side, I think you're really banking on him landing a knockout within the first two rounds. Okay. I, I really do believe that because if this fight, but again, this fight very well could have that knockout, but then you also have Pereira getting the finish in his own right, uh, landing a counter with his hands or mark my words. I'm telling you guys this now, or devastating Jamal Hill's legs and almost stopping the fight due to the leg, the leg, inj uh, the, a leg injury or uh, just putting so much damage on his legs. He's able to tee off on him with the hands and getting a finish there. You guys, I've been very torn with, with who I want to pick for this fight. Part of me says that Jamal Hill is going to get a knockout here. I could easily see it. Even though if you guys are following me on IG, I put this out. I said, for anyone who, who doesn't understand how sports betting works, Jamal Hill at plus 115 means that if you bet $100 on him to beat Alex Pereira, at UFC 300, you lose $100, right? Kind of joking that he's going to lose the fight. If you don't know, and I'll give you guys behind the scenes now, if you don't really know how I feel about this fight, I don't think that's really the case. I think that Hill can easily win this fight. And I was initially on Hill, but the more I, I turn over some stones here and the injury and, and the calf kicks and uh, Felix Perra can just play it a little safe and not get into a slugfest early on, if he can kind of use his footwork and counter, I'll go, I'll go with Alex Pereira to get the job done here. And obviously, 
he'll be alive to get a finish, but he could also potentially win a decision here. There is that type of potential. Jamal Hill's a durable fighter. Um, Jamal Hill was finished, but it was, if you remember, he got locked into that, that triangle choke and he had the chicken wing dangling as uh, Paul Craig uh, messed him up bad there off his back, you know, twerking on that arm while he had the triangle locked in. But you saw how tough Hill was. He never tapped out and uh, been knocking dudes out uh, since until he just got that decision also over Glover Teixeira where he really had a lot of success in that fight. So, uh, all right, guys, I mean, that, that's that's my pick for the main event there. I mean, I am on Alex Pereira. He's a minus 145. I think the value's on the underdog here. No matter how you go, if you're getting plus odds next to any of these fighters' names, that's the way you would probably want to go if you have to have action on this fight. Um, yeah, that'd be my, my professional advice to you guys is you want to get the fighter with the plus sign next to their name. Now, that's a lot easier said than done when you are a big fan of a fighter or you, you want to root for a fighter and have some fun with it at this in this huge event. I understand that some of you guys are going to be targeting Pereira regardless. I know there's a lot of Pereira fans out there. The smart move, though, would be to take Jamal Hill at plus 120, plus 115, plus 110. All right, so flip a coin on that fight there. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up UFC 300. As promised, I got to hit you up with some parting words. And I was going to tell you a little story, a little birthday story from a young uh, teller uh, or about a young teller. Uh, today is my birthday, and it's a little bit of a funny story. It kind of cir circles back to like, just something you could kind of take into consideration as you live your life. But I remember I had a birthday party when I was probably like eight or nine, I'd say maybe an eight, nine, 10. And uh, the morning of, I got a brand new bike. Uh, it was a chromed out mongoose. If you guys remember the BMX little mongoose bikes, uh, Walmart started to get their hands on those, but that was like a known uh, bike, uh, kind of a cool bike, but Walmart started selling them. And I remember seeing this bike. I wanted it so bad. They started putting the chrome, chromed out with the yellow sticker mongoose. I wanted it so bad. And to my surprise, I got that for my birthday. Now, I've always had very blessed life, not out here complaining, but I was never someone that got like ridiculous gifts, at least compared to some of these other kids uh, that, that were around the way, at least in, in, in regards to like my standard, I've seen these kids get all types of crazy gifts. So it was a big deal for me, man. When I get a bike like that, man, like I was very, very happy to get a bike like that. And uh, I had the birthday party going on. It was a block party. We're throwing water balloons, shooting water guns, running around the block. And that's how I grew up. I know you guys didn't grow up like that. Some of you knew guys, but... Uh, that's how it was back in the nineties, um, you know, running around the streets and, uh, you know, I had my brand new bike and we, you know, we, the way things were back in the day, you never see it nowadays, but we would all just cruise with bikes with squads and whoever's house you're going to or wherever you're going, you just all lay the bikes down in the grass. And what do you know, man, my birthday gift, uh, somebody snagged it. And, you know, as I got older, I kind of saw how that went, you know, just the older kids cutting through houses and smoking, smoking blunts, just cruising around, drinking beers, you know? Uh, you know, they, they see a bike, they snag it. And I understand as I got older, I could picture exactly how that happened, but dude, I was devastated because that was right when my birthday was kind of kicking off. I loved that bike and, uh, got snagged, but you know, just, you know, you look back, that was like a, a devastating day back when I was a kid. I look back, I laugh at that now. And, um, just a funny story there, man. And, um, I just would tell you guys this, man, any ups and downs you guys go through, you're always going to, well, for the most part, you're going to be able to look back and get a laugh at a laugh out of those situations. So just think about that. If you're going through a tough time, you actually may be able to look back at that in a couple of years and laugh at it. All right. So just don't think it's the end of the world as it's going down. You guys know, I like to always leave you guys with some, some, uh, optimistic type of, of words, man. I hope all you guys are doing great out there. Hope you guys all have a great week. Hope you guys have a blast for this fight card. Hope you guys make money on this fight card. All right. Hit that subscribe, uh, like this, this video, if you can, for me, it means a lot. And I'll leave you guys with all that. All right. Signing out. Tell her. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show. This is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.